How was God at work in Bethel last year? Let's take a moment and look back. We kicked off the fall with an all-team meeting at Franrish Stadium and a focus on influencing the world for Jesus in our small groups. We raised up new leaders, extended God's kingdom, and transformed lives through our next projects. We served our community through service projects like Fall Frenzy, holiday giving opportunities, and share fest. We celebrated regular Bible reading and began memorizing scripture together and have the t-shirts to prove it. We purchased land in Prosser and are pursuing building options. We are close to finalizing a lease for new space for West Pasco. And we launched the Sunday PM service in Richland. We campaigned for marriage through focused prayer, the Love and Respect Conference, and small group studies. We advocated for biblical justice. We built houses and trained leaders in Haiti. We sent people to Mexico, Cambodia, East Asia, and Ecuador. But that just scratches the surface. We made disciples through VBS for Kids, Refuel for Men, Joy for Women, High School Clusters, Middle School Ignite, Mission Trips, and yes, even Target Practice in Prosser. We baptized 100 people who professed faith in Jesus Christ, and we received 91 new members. So, what's next? Good evening. This is, uh, this is one of my favorite meetings. It's sort of like my birthday, although it's not my birthday, but I get to be with people who are committed at the same level that I think I am. Uh, it's nice to be in an army where you're taking a hill and you ask God and a whole bunch of people come up and say, I'm here. And so thank you for being here. I want to just walk through a little bit of how the Lord speaks to me. He, uh, and I get some comfort from the one year Bible. Many of you, ooh, hang on here. Did you see that? I don't know if, uh, if you get to see that on Sunday morning. It's not quite the same ratio. Let me just, let me just say that again because <laughs> I get encouraged here. How many of us are trying to read the Bible every day? Okay, that is wonderful. And it just tells me who we are. Well, in the one-year Bible, you don't have to be in that plan, but we're also, besides in the New Testament, just ending John and in Acts now, we're in the life of David, more written about David than anyone but Jesus. And I like to watch the, the life of David because when God rescued him or grabbed him from his uh, interesting family life, put him in charge of his people, it changed the nation. The nation was under Samuel and then Saul and all kinds of trauma, but when he found a man after his own heart, it changed all kinds of things. And I take some comfort from David's life because David wrote a great deal of the Old Testament in the Psalms. There's a lot about him. But as far as I can see, the way he heard God was not like some other people. Samuel heard God talking to him. You remember that when Samuel was there and he said, finally, here am I. Nathan heard God in certain ways. But David heard God sometimes through the Urim and Thummim, sometimes through Lot's, most of the time through prophets. And so David heard God, but he didn't hear God a lot of times unless God would speak to him through patterns. You'll see that David many times, it takes two or three pieces of evidence for him to make a decision. Uh, Sometimes you'll see this coming in, Bathsheba will come in, then Nathan will come in, or hear from one thing and hear another. Well, that's the same way God speaks to me. He has to give me a theme. To use the uh, wandering through life analogy, I'm walking across a stream, it's going a certain way, and then I walk across another stream and another stream, and I start to look at them and say, you know, there's a pattern here. They're all flowing the same way. And if I'll, if I'll look at them, they'll flow into the same thing, and I can look down the river and say, that's what God is doing. To use another analogy, there's some dots that get lined up, and I see them lining up. God says this, this, and this, and then if I just look down, I think, I think that's the way the line is going. And so I want to just walk through a little bit of what God has been dotting in my life or streaming in my life. I'm just going to put three of these dots together. The first one, and, it's, and you've been around for some of this too, is the whole area in Bethel of missions. I think it was around in 03 when I first went to Africa, and I saw there 41 pastors, three Bibles. I don't know how many were believers. First time that those pastors had ever been gathered together. And you know this story, I guess, that, that God moved in my heart, and I stood up and said, this cannot be. We've got to do something. Yes, there's age. Yes, there's orphans dying. There's all these things. But if the pastors aren't taken care of, this is just going to be a short-term rescue. We've got to do something. And you responded and I'm so grateful, came back, told the report, we still support over 630 orphans in the Macungwa district, our church does. We've trained not only the original, initial 40, but 40 more who are training others. 
I like that model because the last, and, and Blaine mentioned that he went to Africa, the last crew that went, I went three times, there was another crew that went uh, not that long ago, things are completely different. There are churches that are healthy. Everybody's got their red Bible, which we bought. The 50-some thousand people there, I don't know how many are Christians, but I would guess 80 or 90 percent of them are Christians. The, the churches are healthy. The business is thriving. There's goats and, and cows and chickens. Yeah, <laughs> those are actually animals. I don't think there's lions, tigers, and bears, but there's all kinds of edible and supply kinds of animals. It's just a, it's a different kind of world. That changed me as I thought, because one option before we went there was help us take care of these kids. But you've got to do more than just take care of the kids. We'll talk about that. You have to build something more long-term. So Africa has been a life changer for me. But that's not the only place. Just recently, I went to Haiti, and I was so grateful that our mission in Haiti is to work with a, a group of people called the Haitian Christian Mission and to train pastors. I went there one time. There's been another crew that has gone for that purpose. We send crews all the time, construction crews and medical crews, and I'm so grateful for all those. But foundational with those is the training of the pastors because long-term, something good can happen there. East Asia, I love what we're doing there. I can't say the word, which is a certain kind of dishware that's made in a certain place. I can't say that name. Um, but we, we work in East Asia, and we're training leaders there, and I'm excited about it because those leaders become Christians. They're, they're young people, but they're leaders, and they're going to make a difference. And then in Cambodia, I love the stories of of uh, the changing of the city that's happening. And as you know, not too long ago, we had Justice Weekend. And that was helpful for me. Notice it wasn't called Mercy Weekend. Nothing wrong with mercy. But God in the Old Testament says, I want mercy and I want justice. And they're different. Mercy is to take care of the individual. If you saw, and I've used this illustration, I don't know where I got it. If you saw bodies floating down the river, Mercy is to grab somebody out of the river and, and see if you can help them. Man, and do what you can. Justice is going up river and finding out who's throwing the bodies in. Justice is dealing with the bigger issue. Both are good. Both are necessary. But if all you do is mercy, then after a while you get tired of everybody floating down the river. Somebody needs to go up river and change the culture. And in Cambodia, we're trying to do that. So, stream number one. I know that was wrong long, but there's a whole bunch of things there that are streams or dots that are lining up. You'll hear where we're going in just a second. Stream number two. Besides being in other countries, I've been privileged to be connecting with what I might call national churches lately. Uh, one group of an elder and a pastor came from, and here's a slide, uh, that's John Day. I didn't know where it was, so I thought, well, maybe you didn't either. There it is. Drove through it the other day, or, or by it. I saw a sign anyway. Uh, John Day is a small community, I think something like 1,500 in the particular, in the town per se, 3,000 in the surroundings, but they have 150 mobile homes right in the middle of the city, according to the pastor. And they've taken that on and not calling it a, a trailer court, but a home court. They have a missionary now that they sponsor by their church. They bought a piece of property there. They give free pizza every once in a while to all the uh, occupants there. They sponsor garbage bins, and it's free garbage day. It was pretty funny because the Residents there were concerned that if they cleaned the whole place up, their rent might go up. And uh, <laughs> the church says, that won't happen. We own property here. We'll make sure the rent doesn't go up. But they're trying to win their court. And I thought, that is so cool. I'm glad to be a part of that. They came here, the pastor and the elder, to find out how we could help them. We asked them to come, how they could get small groups going, things like that. And I'm excited that we have some influence in John Day. We not only have influence in John Day, there's another John who lives, here it is, in North Platte. I was just there, Linda and I were just there, and, and Bob Bonner was just there, and Bob and Joyce just recently. There it is, in case you don't want to know. Here's a quick funny story. I probably shouldn't do this, but John was showing North Platte for a sermon uh, the, uh, when we were there, and somehow he had Googled it and it ended up in Kansas. And uh, so here it was on the map. He's only been there five months. He's, he's a, a, a one of ours who just went there. And he's showing that, and the person comes up and says, well, John, I really appreciate your sermon and how we need to move out of Jerusalem, Judea, but North Platte's not in Kansas. And he looks up, and, man, well, here it is. North Platte is in. I think I got it right. It's N-N-E. It's North Platte. But here's the thing. We have an influence there. Uh, real quick, here's, the, here's John and Jessica and the three boys. Uh, there's North Platte Berean Church, and we got to go to the service. There they are, just another shot of them. They're doing well. John calls me every week. In fact, after... After he preached, he said, talk to me about it. I said, 
call me and we talked about it. We're having an influence there in North Platte. And again, I really like what's going on there. Their, their mission's not just to uh, rescue a few people, but to change their community. Two other things under this church's theme. I get to meet with young pastors in the Tri-Cities regularly, and I could name them and you might know them. They're, and there's no, no wonder about this, they're all younger than me. Okay. <laughs> But they're young people. They're young people who are just getting started. And it's exciting to me to say, uh, how can we help? What can we do? In fact, you may not know this, but Bethel is a financial sponsor of all kinds of things that go on. We have a thing called the Philadelphian Fellowship that's just starting with a whole bunch of young pastors. We're sponsoring the pastors that come in. We'll, we'll pay for that. That's one of our assets. We can pay for them to grow because we'd love to see that happen. I get, I get the chance to meet with these young pastors. In fact, this morning, the new pastor at Grandview Nazarene came, and he's really excited about the work we're doing in Prosser, and he said, anything we can do. I said, well, it's, the shoe's also on the other foot. How can we help you? How can we help you in Grandview to win the lower value? So that, that's another stream, missions and what's going on there. Young pastors and pastors in this area and what's going on there. And the final dot, and then I'll get to what this all boils down to, is it's been my privilege recently, in fact, so recent as to yesterday, I met another one, to meet leaders in the Tri-Cities. Fathers, that's true, but business leaders and government leaders and political leaders. And as I meet them, I'm impressed that these are Christian people. They're Christian people, and they're trying to take their sphere of influence and make it salt and light. And sometimes I wish I could just be an aerial view and look at the Tri-Cities with spiritual eyes, and I could see around these leaders, whether they're families or businesses or politics or whatever, I could see, see a sphere of light. My hope is those spheres of light will grow until pretty soon you can't go to a dark place in the Tri-Cities because the spheres are overlapping. Well, that's what I hope. That's, that's part of it. So here's, here's where we're going with all that, is I, is I get to interact with mission strategy and with young churches and what's going on there and with leaders and start to dream about what God might want to do in our community. I put together and I, matched, I asked uh, Dave Dawson, our outreach guy, does this really match our mission strategy? He says it does. It's not necessarily their nomenclature, but here it is. It's an ABC strategy. The ABC strategy of changing our world. I think it's biblical, so here it is. You don't have to take notes. Isn't that cool? But here it is. Uh, here's the uh, A part. Each, each A, B, and C is followed by a C. But the first part that what God has called us to do is the mercy part. It's to aid the captives. You could say rescue prisoners. Jesus, when he inaugurated his ministry in Luke chapter 4, said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Notice each thing that he talks about, each person category, is somebody who needs aid, some kind of captive, whether blind or a prisoner or poor, some kind of captive. Later on, he said this after in the, in the sight of Zacchaeus or in the presence of Zacchaeus, the Son of Man came to seek and save, last three words, what was lost. He's talking about people. And any investment strategy, any mission strategy that we have has to consider, we ha the bottom line is, are you rescuing people? It's not just about organizations and all those things. Are people being changed? Are we making disciples? All the way from people who don't know Christ to people who do and need to grow. One more scripture here. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Paul writing to Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's what it's all about. Any strategy that we have has to be about changing people, rescuing people. Now, the picture I have of this first part of any kind of investment strategy is this. This is a house. In a sense, a ministry is a safe house for people who have no shelter. People who are prisoners or blind or whatever they're or poor or oppressed, they have a place that they can go. And a ministry, it's going to have any credibility and any, I believe, mercy before God has to have the aiding captives part. Make sense? Okay. But that's not enough. If all we did in Africa was aid the orphans, if all we did in Cambodia was rescue the street people, if all we did was build houses to rescue people, here's the problem. Remember the little house on the prairie? I always thought, that's spooky. There's Indians out there, right? And there's just this little house on the prairie and all kinds of enemies all around, man. I don't want a little house on the prairie. I want something a little more secure than that. And a ministry that just aids captives is still dealing with all the things floating down the river. You've got to do more. Make sense? So here's the B part. It is build churches. Any ministry that's going to change the world 
has to build churches. You have to do that because the church, well, well, we'll show you what the Scripture, well, let me just do it. Here's what Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy, stay on in Ephesus, get elders going there because I'm writing if I'm delayed so you'll know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's family, God's household, which is the church of the living God. Two things, the pillar, which means like the display case, and the foundation, the basis of the truth. Somebody once asked, is the family or the church the foundation of society? The church is. The church is supposed to build good families, no doubt about that. But families don't, good families without the scripture, without the truth, will not build good churches and eventually things will collapse. America's not collapsing because the family's collapsing. America's collapsing because the church is. The church is the hope of the world. It's God's family. Now, I'm, I'm pro-family. That's not the issue. But if you have a church, you can rescue people. If you have a church that's built in Africa, you can change families. And suddenly there won't be orphans and there won't be AIDS and families will be healthy. But the church is God's plan to rescue people. So any strategy, any strategy of changing any kind of place is, is going to involve building churches because you don't want to be alone on the prairie. The way I have pictured this is now you have a city. So uh, this is one of our graphic guys. I appreciate that. It's a city is, in fact, in the Old Testament, you had cities of refuge, not just houses, but cities. Suddenly, you're not all alone on the prairie. There's all the gifts that can happen. There's a spiritual infrastructure. There's the pastors who teach. There's the other people who do all kinds of things, and you have a city. And so you aid captives. You build churches. But can you guess from what I've already said that this is yet not enough? See, there's something missing about this. It's little city on the prairie. And there's still lots of enemies out there. Just think about it. What does a city need for protection? You can think about that in just a minute. Don't say it necessarily. But here's the third. Here's the C. We aid captives. We build churches. And we change culture. Now, that doesn't mean that aren't, there aren't good parts of every culture. No matter where you go, whether it's Cambodia or Haiti or Africa, there are wonderful things about that culture that are God-given things. Same in America. But God sends people to take those good things, but also to change the things that aren't so good. Here's what Paul told Timothy that relates to our changing culture. Timothy, as you're there in Ephesus, I urge that you make prayers, requests, intercession, thanksgiving for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good. Pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Timothy, somehow the way that kings and those in authority handle you makes a difference in God's program of saving people. I want you to pray for the government leaders. I want you to pray for those who form, and here it is, the wall around you. Because if those are good people, if those are lined up with God's purposes, God will see people saved. If the, if the whole economy, if the whole government is not secure around you, God's purposes are not done. So pray for kings and those in authority. Here's what Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth, talking to disciples. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. I believe that Christians are not only captive rescuers and church builders, they are also culture changers. That's what salt's all about. That's what light is all about. So the slide is this. I believe when the leaders of the culture are changed, business, kings, all the families, fathers, all those things, suddenly you have a wall around the city. The wall is it's government protection and economic protection and all those things. So where am I going with all this? I've asked myself, not just about missions, because I think our strategy invo involving missions is are we investing in ABC strategy? Make sense? I think Africa is that. I think Cambodia is that. In fact, as we talk together. I believe that's our strategy now, not just to take care of captives, they'll certainly do that, not just to build churches, they'll certainly do that, but to change culture as well. So that when we leave there, and here's the good news about Makungwa, I'm guessing in two or three years, we'll be through in Makungwa, we'll move on to another place, but they will not only be self-sustaining with pastors and government leaders who love the Lord, they will be sending missionaries. They'll be doing Everything that we're doing, why? Because there'll be a, not just a house, not just a city. There'll be a city with a wall, and they'll be sending people out. That's the point. Make sense? That's where you want to invest. So I've asked myself as I've thought about this, uh, is Bethel a good investment? If you're going to invest your money, and really it's God's money, in kingdom purposes, is your tithe, is your investment to Bethel a good investment? 
Well, one thing I can say is if we're investing in good missions, at least 12% of it is good investment, right? <laughs> but I would like to present, I guess, that I believe that we are a good investment. That, and, and of course, it, in one sense, it doesn't matter because if you get fed here, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to take care of us. But in another sense, it's nice to know that the money that you're giving, the time you're giving, the heart that you're giving, the prayers you're giving are a good investment. So what I want to do is just cast a little vision of what it is that the Lord wants us to do uh, next year among the things we need to do. And so here they are. Here's, uh, here's number one. We have, as you know, purchased land in Prosser. We also have an agreement with an architect and a builder. We're not in the pre-design phase anymore. We're in the design phase. The architect has been set free to design Here's a potential floor plan for it. Next slide just shows a little bit about where it might be on the uh, property. There it is. You recall, here it is, two more slides. There's the property from one angle. Here's the property from another. If you haven't been out there, you, you can go out there, 25 acres. We, in our budgeting or our dreaming for this next year, hope to begin building a building in Prosser. Why? Because I think Prosser's ripe. Anybody been to Prosser? If you're from Prosser, you have. I... I <laughs> I go there and I get excited because those people love the Lord and they love their community and I think when we get a building there, it's already busting at the seams, but when we get a building there, there's going to be a whole bunch of people who don't come now because it's hard to have your kids in the cafe next door and all those things. There's going to be a whole bunch of people who, who want to come to church who will come. There'll be other people who come who don't come to church anyway because they'll see something going on and say, what's going on over there? And they'll come. And there are hundreds there now. I think there'll be hundreds and hundreds more. That, I think, is worth investing in. And so we're, we've, uh, the first bid that came in, we thought, no, that's not right, and the Prosser Building Committee agreed with us, but now we have a bid that we think is workable and a, and a plan we think is workable. So right on the horizon is building a building in Prosser. We'd like to do it without debt, but we're not going to do it with government funding. <laughs> so it, it's going to be up to us. So I wanted to tell you, in the budget is that, that contingency. Here, here's another one. Uh, you saw also there the Pasco lease, and you heard on the review that it's a possibility. It's in Broadmoor. Uh, we, uh, we have a verbal agreement on the lease. We haven't signed it yet because we have to go before the city and have a hearing about the use of it. We think there's a pretty good likelihood it'll happen because in the same space is another church that is eager for us to be there. There's the outside shot, three more shots. There's one of the views of the inside. Of course, it needs to be all redesigned, and that needs to be approved by engineers, but we have somebody working on that. Uh, if this lease should happen, it would be probably in the fall that, that Pasco would begin new services there, and I, we believe that that's going to change their, their dynamic there too. If you've been to, to uh, Pasco, they have to be out of there by 10.30 or 11, and it's just kind of awkward. You go in, the two services are simultaneous, so you've got the worship team here and then going there, and it's, I tried preaching there once, and I was confused. Um, <laughs> so we think this is going to set them free, and that we're going to see if the Lord will use this to reach more people in Pasco. Just one more illustration because it's, uh, I think it's relevant too and I'm excited about it. Uh, one of the next projects, we're in the same position as we are with Pasco. We have a verbal agreement on a lease. It's a lease. It was, uh, maybe you know about the coffee shop or you've heard about that. It was one of the next proposals. Uh, here is the place where it is. There's Bethel Church down on the bottom. Right up uh, on Keene and uh, Queensgate is a cleaners. Have you seen that with a drive-in there? And next to it's a fitness shop. Both of those are going down. And we have the verbal agreement to have the cleaners part and then part of the, the uh, exercise place. And there it is. You can see there it is, the future coffee, coffee space. That, too, looks like it might start in the fall. I'm not a coffee drinker, but I'm planning on being there. <laughs> because it's not just going to be a coffee shop. It's going to be a coffee shop with a mission, a coffee shop where the money goes to projects. And I'm, I'm, like others, envisioning that you can go in there and find out about Cambodia. You can buy things from different mission places, and all the profit goes there. It'll be unlike, and we have young people who know these things, it will not be alcohol-driven, which a lot of the meeting places are, and unlike most coffee shops, it will stay open late. Most of them quit about 7. So, and there's probably because you don't want to drink coffee after 7, but there'll be other, <laughs> there'll be other things you can do. So we're, we're believing that this will be a young person rescue place. Okay, now, just a couple more comments and I'll be done. I believe a big part of our uh, slowdown in giving last year is me. It's not because I'm not walking with the Lord. I'm walking with the Lord. It's because I haven't talked about money. We've been in the New Testament. I haven't felt, 
I haven't felt it fair yet to have a series of money. I think it's been three years since we've talked to the new disciples about money. And I know, I, I, I know that Bethel is generous. If we ask for money, you will give. It's just the way it is. We just haven't asked. So I look at that downturn, and I know there's lots of people talking, but I look at that and say, that's me. That's my bad. I don't know if you've ever had a family issue that you know as the leader, if you just deal with it, it would, it would change, but you just haven't yet. Well, there's that. But I thought, I'm going to tell you. You're the members. I'm going to tell you that's why it is. You might say, well, Bethel's got lots of money. Well, we got some huge things coming up, building a building, two leases. Not only that, we've limited, as Blaine said, our salaries to 50% of the total. So when the total goes down, we have some salary trauma, and we had that this year. We didn't mention it a whole bunch, but we will not go over 50%. And so when the, the budget goes down, we don't hire, we do some other things because that's the way it is. Now, there's cushion up here to do things with, but not in salary because we have decided to hold that line. We just don't want to get further than that. So that has been a reality in this last year. But I'm telling you as members, I think Bethel's a good investment. And I'm telling you, all the money you see there that says we're going to try to raise $5 million, guess who that is? That's us. There's no government. There's no other people. That's us. So if you want to count the people here, divide by $5 million. <laughs> there's another reason I believe that blip went down. It's me, but there's another reason. I think this last year we have been focusing really hard on passing authority to the young generation. And there have been some older generation people who have, and I understand this, thought, you know what, this is not a place for me anymore. And there have been some people, significant people, as far as giving goes, who've left the church. And they're, they're on good terms with us. The ones I know are on good terms. It's not about that. But we have put young people in their places. And young people don't have the money to give. And so as the older people go, and I, I think we've turned a corner, not about giving, but about those traumatic times. We had some traumatic times for a while. But did you notice tonight the people who are playing? I never know who's going to play. In fact, I don't know half the people who are playing. But, but they're young and they're disciples, and they're learning, and the next generation has a hold of the guitar, and the next generation has a hold of the mic, and they've got some things going, and I'm excited because I'm of the generation that's going to fade out pretty quick, but we've got young people that are doing things, and so there's another reason I think that that blip went down a little bit. So here's what I'm asking. Uh, I guess we're going to pray about this, but here's what I'm asking. Don't give up on giving to the church. I think we're a good investment. And our pledge, my pledge is, I will try to do everything I can to assure us and assure God, because we have a mind to do what is right before God and right before people, that your money is well spent, strategically spent, that we will be rescuing captives as much as we can, building churches. You don't always know that, but we're, doing, we're trying to do that even in our community, and changing the culture and raising up leaders who can, who can change this culture.